I don't know if you have been enjoying these vlogs in the watching sense, but I have been enjoying these vlogs in the filming sense. So I'm going to continue to do them. Good morning, it is 6.30 a.m. I woke up, spritzed some perfume, threw on a hat. We're gonna go vote today. We have to go vote. It is the New York primary and it is my personal tradition because the voting polls are very close to my apartment to go vote and then go treat myself to Dunkin' Donuts. Also on the agenda today is launch for work. So today I get to sit for a two hour presentation where all the editorial staff presents the summer 2023 list. So I get to see what books I'll be working on next year in summer. I have x-rays today for the good old elbow. These x-rays will determine hopefully when my next surgery will be. So keep your fingers crossed for some good news. I really hope that I get some good news. And that is most of my day's agenda. I'm working from home today. Normally I go into the office on Tuesdays, but because of all of the events that are about to transpire, I'm sticking around at home until I have to go for those x-rays. And of course, I wanna read some books. Here are five books on my TBR. I've noticed that my physical TBR is getting pretty cluttered with shorter reads, so I think that's what I hope to accomplish in this vlog, just read with more focus. I don't necessarily know how many days this vlog will last because who does, but <laughs> I figured I would tell you about what I plan on reading and I will check in as I read these books. Three of these books are already on my most anticipated reads of the year list, so you may have heard me talk about them before. The first is The Kingdom of Sand by Andrew Holleran, which I started last night, and I'm already really enjoying the very cosmopolitan tone that it takes. Looking forward to diving in more to this. I have Nuclear Family by Joseph Hahn, which I have read the first chapter of, but then set aside for other reading that I had to do because library holds sometimes come in and you really just, you gotta do it. You now before they escape. I am excited to read more. Also love this cover. Like that was the reason it was on my most anticipated books list. Next is Bitter Orange Tree by Joka Alharti. This is translated by Marilyn Booth. The same duo won the Booker International Prize for Celestial Bodies, which is a book that I super loved. Don't know anything about this, but I'm excited to dive into it. Again, also really good cover. I talked about this book in my Books I Want to Read for Pride Month video, and that is Bitter by Akwaiki Amezi. If I read this book, I will have read every book that Akwaiki Amezi currently has published, so definitely want to do that. The last book is a book that I just got in the mail, which you may have seen in my previous vlog, and that was The Scent of Burnt Flowers by Blitz Bazawule. And I don't know anything about this. Again, it was a cover purchase. So as a quick recap, we're going to be reading some books for however long it takes me to read some books. Today we are going to vote, do some work, get some x-rays, do some more work, and hopefully be a human boy. Hello, good morning. My sunscreen is currently setting before I go out on a morning walk, so I thought I would tell you about The Kingdom of Sand. I finished this book last night, slept on it, and this morning I still have incredibly mixed feelings about it. I feel like, am I to talk about my dislike or aversion to this text, people will point to a generational difference between me and the main character of this book, or even the author himself. And that might be true, that might point to a reason why I didn't enjoy this as much as I had hoped to enjoy it. But I also think that dour dispositions can still simply be 
frustrating to read, despite the fact that they are written earnestly, very well, within the circumstances of the world, etc. And I find this to be an incredibly dour text. It is a text that specifically is reconciling with mortality and lacking community and loneliness as we age, specifically as gay men age. Gay men who lived through the AIDS crisis, survived, saw so many of their friends die, and are clinging to whatever life they feel that they have left. But I think the frustration I feel, it might be generational in that there is so much life you have left, and for this main character and for the people he surrounds himself with, there is a resignation to solitude that is heartbreaking and therefore I think successful, but it's also just like on a, on a human level, incredibly frustrating because this book goes through the Obama years and into near present day and like the internet exists. <laughs> and as somebody who has found deep connection to community on the internet and as somebody who knows people of this main character's age who have done the same, isolation doesn't necessarily feel as valid. It feels like a self decision. With that come bouts of internalized homophobia, something that I don't think that the main character has the verbiage to actually unpack. He is constantly aware of his sexuality, worried that other people think about his sexuality, fearful that his sexuality might in some way deter him from living a full life, but in that fear deters himself from living a full life. And I understand that we are dealing with a small town community and where he is might be more dangerous for him to be out and about and proud. However, I think that his experiences through the AIDS crisis, through active persecution of queer people, and even today, still happening, our rights are very quickly being taken away from us he himself doesn't feel like he is able to be himself, even in the quiet of his own home. So it's tricky. I, I find it hard to read characters who lack curiosity. And this is a character who very much has a strict view of the world. So there is a disconnect between me and empathy when trying to reach him. The writing is incredibly pleasurable to read. I did mention that there is a nice cosmopolitan tone and feel to this book. It's incredibly poised. It moves at a steady pace. There is a slew of simile in this text though, and similes that like wind into characters' personal anecdotes or incredibly acute literary references that I do think well-read readers will appreciate, but even as somebody who reads a lot, found a little bit, I don't know, like a desperate attempt to connect to a reader. And in many ways that echoes the main character's drive, that there is a constant desperate drive to connect. But I don't, like it, what? <sighs> I'm frustrated. I find so much of this to be successful. I find so much of it to be off-putting and I'd be curious to hear from readers older than I what they thought of this book, because I do think that the confrontation of mortality is something that I likely have a very different relationship to than people who are older than me. But at the same time, a book is a book and should be able to reach across despite you know? I don't know. I will be talking about this book again in my next wrap-up of anticipated reads, so maybe my thoughts will be better formed at that time. But I'm happy that I finished this book because today I can start Nuclear Family by Joseph Hahn and make my way through this very, very different story.
we meet again in this spot. I mean, honestly, this is the place with the best lighting in my apartment, so if it's morning, this is where I am. I have a busy day ahead of me. I have a lot of meetings. I think I'm in more meetings than I am non-meetings in terms of like hours in which I will spend my day. But we're keeping up our same rhythm and last night I finished Nuclear Family by Joseph Hahn. And I really enjoyed this book. Is this a book that I will remember thoroughly in the next year? Probably not, but I really enjoyed it now and I will recommend it to people. And I think that Joseph Hahn will be an author whose next book I automatically purchase. What is most successful about this is its tragicomic humor. There is never a moment without some sort of touch of irony, despite how dark and dramatic it may be. It is a touching family story. It is incredibly fraught and incredibly smart. And I think the textual qualities of it are really compelling that in moments of high stakes stress, there was a scene where the narration switched to second person and it was like this blissfully dissociative, intense scene. Or there is a whole section where the text builds upon itself and then collapses, which was actually heartbreaking to experience on the page and was earned from such a successful build-up to it that this book is incredibly playful as it is heartfelt and it is an incredibly immersive experience to really like dive into it and be so dedicated to text. Each character has such a specific tone of voice even like the spacing of their paragraphs feels specific to them so that you constantly know who you are hearing from. You never really forget. There are sections of redactions that I found to be particularly heartbreaking, although perhaps not even intentionally so. I think this book is just doing a lot at once and in a successful way that it is emotional as it is funny as it is political as it is familial. Again, I will be discussing this book in my next Most Anticipated Books wrap-up video, so hopefully my thoughts will be better formed there, but I enjoyed this. This is like a four-star read for me. But next we go from something anticipated to something I literally know nothing about other than that it has a pretty cover. This is The Scent of Burnt Flowers. I will be reading it today and I will check in with you whenever I, I do that, that reading. I haven't done anything today. Um, I've, I've only done maybe like three whole things. But one of those things was finished, The Scent of Burnt Flowers. Now you might be thinking, Matthew, this book is 230 pages. How did you finish it so quickly? And the answer is Dion Graham reads the audiobook for this. And I had access to the audiobook and I've listened to a lot of Dion Graham audiobooks. So I can listen to his at a fast pace. And so I finished this. This is a, a very unremarkable book, um, unfortunately. I wish I had enjoyed it more than I did. I like the cover far more than I actually like the book. It is about a couple in 1960s America who flee America and seek asylum in Ghana. And there is suspense. The dialogue is tight but everything else is so messy. It's just a messy book. There's not much to it that I think really worked other than like some sort of feeling of like cat and mouse, which is built into the plot of the book. Um, it's incredibly adjective heavy. It feels a little bit unedited. While I enjoyed a little bit of the touch of magic that was in the text, I wish it had been better developed. And also for a novel that was suspenseful, I wish that the author had trusted himself to simply have suspense. But instead, he doubles down and gives us these incredibly trite, noir, crime fiction-y sort of lines, like really cliche lines of basically iterations of, and then you won't believe what happened next, or it was a day like any other. 
and you won't believe what happens next. Like <laughs> there are a lot of like prompts almost in the text to keep you reading. And they were so unnecessary because a lot of this story was already suspenseful. The way that the characters feel is suspenseful. The way that they talk to one another, their emotional responses to circumstances. That's all in there. So to give us these like obtuse inserts was frustrating. It's like sort of a thriller, sort of a romance, sort of a commentary on civil rights and historical America, sort of an immigrant story, sort of like it's just too many. It's sort of a bunch of things, but not actually one thing. And I think that's why I'm frustrated. It needed some tightening up, I think. And this is already a very short book. So that's a bummer, but it also means that I can move on to Bitter Orange Tree by Joka Alharti, translated by Marilyn Booth, which I know for a fact I will enjoy. Like there's not a chance that this duo did Celestial Bodies together and that their next book would be bad. I'm going to start reading this. Today I am finishing up work. I'm going to go to a little picnic in Prospect Park and that's kind of it. So I've decided to wrap these two books up together, mostly because I don't have much to say about them. They're both incredibly lovely. I enjoyed them. I highly recommend them. But neither really blew me away or upended any favorites lists that I might have for the year. Um, I expected to love Bitter by Aquaki Amezi. I love Aquaki Amezi's writing. I love their stories. I love the worlds that they build. This takes place in the same world as Pet, and I think is just like a more mature offshoot to Pet, where Pet is a middle grade. This feels very YA. It's very cute. The friendships are lovely. The relationships are charming. There is active discussion of like hookup culture and dating in a way that I thought was really accessible and realistic for the age in question. It's also a story about protest and revolution and using your skill to make change. And in many ways it's instructional in that regard. And I really thought that that was cool for the age demographic. Um, this is amazing. It's so good. I, I like, obviously it's so good. And I love especially the magic that is in it. This kind of connection between art and the creation of art echoing life and the things that we foster in life. And I thought that that was just really well done, that this main character, Bitter, can make their art come to life. The way that it's portrayed, the thematic resonance of that, all of it, just really well executed. So, loved. And Bitter Orange Tree, also loved. What I think I found most successful about this book was that the beginning chapters go as follows. We get like, memory of the past, cut to present day character, and then Joka Alharti's like, okay, are you ready? Now we're gonna do this. <laughs> and it just mixes it all together. And I think what is so successful about this book is the seamless way that we slip in and out of the past. It reminds me very much of like reading Ali Smith, that timeline doesn't necessarily matter in certain moments so much as like vibe or experience. However, we do get a lot of history with this book that I really appreciated. We get to see the relationships that build to the life of the main character in the present that I really liked. And there's a little bit of 
campus life thrown in that I thought was interesting. The writing is incredibly crisp, it's incredibly poised, it's lovely to read. I don't think I liked this book as much as Celestial Bodies. Celestial Bodies was a solid five-star read for me and something that I've been meaning to reread, but this is a perfectly wonderful four-star read. So like, again, loved, would recommend both of these books. But it is currently 90 degrees outside, so I'm going to turn off this camera go hide in front of my air conditioner and edit this footage. I hope you enjoyed watching this vlog with me. I hope you enjoyed hearing about my thoughts about the books spliced between B-roll. If you have any questions, thoughts, comments, opinions, or beliefs about anything that I mentioned in this video, you can put those below. Otherwise, thank you so much for watching and I hope to see you soon.